All right, everybody, we are going to open this up and let people start coming in. We'll give everyone a few minutes just to come in. Uh, Brian Lewis is here. Brian, good to see you. It's been a long time. Let's see. Oh, Michael Sampson, you're here. A lot of people flowing in right now. I'm going to miss everybody. I'm not sure who's coming in anymore. But it's good to see everybody. I think Paul Puglia is here. Antonio Cruz. Yeah, we'll just give everyone a few moments to flow. And I've noticed with these Zoom things, a bunch of people all come in at once. It, all, it doesn't all happen once it flows in. It makes it look like it's people flowing into a room in real life. Oh, Gavin. Gavin Simpson, good to see you. He was one of our previous speakers from just a few months ago. As people roll in, we'll just uh, sit here and say hi to who we can. Oh, Bill Gold, one of our speakers. Katarina, another speaker. A lot of a lot of speakers speaking uh, coming up for this talk. Okay. Uh, for those of you just coming in, there's some exciting announcements out of our studio today. You know, Max put out his new used model package, and they also put out the torch package today. So those are all fun. I had a fun day reading those blog posts. All right, as people start to come in, we'll start rolling slowly. We'll do our normal announcements. So first thing, everyone, welcome to the September meetup. We uh, squeeze it in with uh, one day left to go in the month. Uh, we are very excited for this. Uh, before we even get started, as we always do, jobs. Now, obviously, we can't all be announcing jobs in the Slack right now. So if people, I think, believe Amada made a channel here. Uh, you called the channel? The uh, um, September. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Ma. It's September 29th meetup. So everyone go into there. But if you have a job posting, actually, we love getting people jobs. Go to the job postings channel. Uh, in fact, if Amato, can you can you make a link directly to a channel and and send it on, on in Zoom? If you can, that'd be awesome. Uh, if anyone's looking to hire people, go to the job postings channel and post your job in there. If you're looking to get a job, go into the job postings channel and apply to them. Nice. Uh, bringing people together. Hopefully one day we'll be able to do this again in person when I can actually have people go up to each other in the room, say, hey, I'm hiring, hey, I'm looking for a job. We love this. Uh, so again, if you have a job, you're looking to hire someone, go to job postings, post it right in there. Uh, hopefully we'll get some people some work. Um, give me one second. Pizza. I know we all are missing our communal pizza. This month I got my pizza from a place called Brothers. It's been sitting here for a little bit, so it's very good cheese lock. See on the back, this was, it has some charring, which would make me think it was made in a coal oven, but I know this place uses a gas oven. So I'm not sure what's going on with that, that at the bottom there, but you can tell by the, the coloring that it was indeed gas. So we're not gonna be disappointed by that. Uh, so if everyone has their pizza from wherever they're enjoying it from, I hope you got it from somewhere good or at least somewhere you like. Uh, and hope everyone's having a, a, you know, a good quarantine of your pizza. I've been going to so many different pizza places, it, it's kind of nice. Followed by a lot of ice cream. So let me just, Put that pizza off to the side. I'd like to thank Eco Health Alliance for providing the Zoom link again. Thank you very much, uh, Noam, for providing this for us every month. It's been really, really helpful getting this link from you. Oh, hold on, I have a visitor. Do you want to come here? Sorry, buddy. I have someone Zoom bombing, uh, so he's just gonna have to join us for a little bit. Uh, he has an R T-shirt, which he's not wearing right now. He has a few R T-shirts. So thank you, Eco Health Alliance. It's been uh, very helpful them enabling us to do the Zoom meetings. It's been really great. Uh, coming up, we're announcing in the, this week. Oh, you, you're done with me? Okay. We, we are we are announcing uh, this week our annual R conference in Washington D.C. Uh, it takes place early December. Oh, there's Becky. Say hi, Becky. <laughs> Regular member of the meetup. Um, she hasn't been coming off so as often anymore because of the baby, but hopefully she can attend for this one. So in December, December third and fourth. We have our third annual R conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, this year, we're really focusing on government, NGO, local nonprofits, defense, and all sorts of things revolving around the federal sector and local governments and state governments. Uh, 
Uh, we have a great lineup coming at you that will be officially announced soon, but it's really packed this year with people working for the FDA, for I believe the CDC, for the Defense Department, for the International Development Bank, maybe the World Bank, a bunch of different organizations. <laughs> We're really, really excited for this. Um, well, again, we'll be announcing this either this week or next week officially. Uh, we'll be sending out an email blast and the sign-up page, but you can go to rstats.ai to check out what's up there for now. And speaking of rstats.ai, you can go there and check out soon, not quite yet, but very soon, we'll have all the videos from this year's NYR talk, uh, NYR conference. That includes all of the great speakers like Max Kuhn, David Robinson, Emily Robinson, Luda, we have just a whole fun day. Andrew Gellman's videos, it's gonna be a lot. Of, it's a whole great trove of videos coming up. <laughs> Sorry folks, you hear a little screaming. Um, we have our next three months planned out for the meetup. I know that rarely happens. We're really super excited that we actually have three months planned in advance. We even have the dates for most of these in advance, which I don't have on me, but we'll live with that. Next month, we have Katerina Constantinescu talking about data validation. Uh, it's gonna be fun. Then in November, we have Henrik Bengston talking about the future package and doing parallel computing um, very easily using the various future packages. There's so many of them. And then in December, we'll have Will Landau talking about targets. If you remember a few months ago, we had a talk about Drake. Um, that, that came from Miles McBain. Well, targets is the next iteration of Drake. So it's gonna be interesting to see how they stack up to each other, how they compare. And by the way, these last two speakers, um, Henrik and Will, the way we got them, I noticed they were attending the talk about Drake and they mentioned the comments. So I said to them, hey, you folks wanna give a talk. We have November, December open and they're speaking November, December. It happens that way. So whoever wants to be the January speaker, send us a message. You know how to get in touch with me. Um, you, know, you can find me at jaredlander.com, send us a message on Slack, send us a, send a Mata message, send anyone at any of my team members a message and we'll see who wants to give a talk. Uh, that's what happens. We have our speaker this month who I you've watched his videos online and I sent him an email. Hey, you want to give a talk? And he said, yes, that's how it happens here, folks. So that's all of my announcements. Amada, did I miss anything? I'm uh, not right now, right? We have three awesome meetups and the, our conference. Yes. Focusing on government. That's it. <laughs> right. Oh, and stand workshop. We've done, usually we do one stand workshop a year. This year, we might do a second stand workshop because it's all virtual. So maybe coming up later this year, we'll do a stand workshop. We'll see about that. So with all that stuff, coming to us all the way from Long Island, not quite as far as other people, but still far away in these times. Uh, we have a speaker who, like I said, I've been watching his videos on YouTube for quite a while now. I've learned a lot about customizing my command prompt. And like, I'm guessing many of you, you started using R, the command prompt is a little scary for you. Like R felt comfortable, you could do what you're doing, but the command prompt sounded a little far and what if I screw something up? Uh, and even though you might be good at coding, that was always off-putting, at least for me. And I'm assuming that a lot of people feel that way. So I've been watching uh, Nick's videos for a while now. It's made me feel a lot more comfortable and made me have a much better command line experience. So I'm very excited to bring to us all the way from the middle of Long Island, Nick, please join us. Thank you very much for speaking, Nick. Yeah, no problem. Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, hey everyone, thanks a lot for coming. My name is Nick Genetakis, and today we're going to go over creating a command line driven development environment. By the end of this talk, you'll be well on your way to having a tricked out terminal, along with being familiar with tools like Tmux and Vim, and also being comfy using command line tools to solve real world problems. We're also going to go over how you can manage your dot files. These are files that typically live in your home directory, and they're responsible for configuring a bunch of command line tools. Just a heads up, everything we go over today is going to work on all major distros of Linux, Mac OS, and Windows 10. In the case of Windows, it will be expected that you're using WSL1 or WSL2, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux. That's because we're going to focus on shell scripting in a Unix or Unix-like environment, not so much PowerShell. Also, we're going to cover a lot of ground in this talk, but don't worry, I'm not going to leave you hanging on installing and configuring everything on your own from scratch. Feel free to check out this Git repo afterwards. It has a very skimmable reference for everything we're going to cover, as well as this slide deck. With that said, let me uh, quickly introduce myself. My name is Nick Genetakis, and I've been a freelance web developer for the last 20-ish years, and I would say for the last seven or so years, I've been doing a lot of DevOps work. Uh, that's mainly setting up Linux servers, working with various cloud hosting providers, deploying code, writing shell scripts, and using tools like Docker, Ansible, and Terraform. Now, the specifics aren't too important, but I do think working with a bunch of different technologies and projects 
has led me to having a command line focused development environment. Now, chances are you're not using the same tech stack as me, but we can all use the same commands to solve our unique problems. For example, I found myself bouncing around so many different freelance and open source projects, and I wanted a way to quickly switch between them to get right back into a project as if I never left. That led me to discovering Tmux and eventually Vim. And by the way, if you decide you don't want to use Vim as a primary code editor, that's completely fine. I only started using Vim about a year and a half ago, mainly because the combination of using it with Tmux really let me quickly switch between projects on the command line. But even if you don't use Vim, there is so much more to the command line than code editing, and Tmux is really useful in any case. Now, before we dive into the basics of using Tmux and other tools, let me quickly go over a couple of practical examples of how I use Tmux, Vim, and various command line tools in my day to day. I'm going to kind of blaze through this without explaining things in detail so you can get a high level overview of how everything fits together and see what types of workflows you can create. This way, you can start thinking about how all of this applies back to your dev environment. Then after that, we'll go back and cover how everything works and how everything can be configured in more detail. Also, just a heads up for the sake of time and avoiding silly mistakes like typos, I decided to go with animated GIFs for demoing a few things. That means you'll occasionally see animations that are looping indefinitely, and they may not line up exactly with what I'm saying, but I think you'll get the gist of it. Lastly, feel free to ask questions if anything isn't clear, because I am prepared to jump into a live terminal if needed. Okay, let's do this. So here's a brand new terminal that I just opened. And let's say I want to start working on the source code to my Flask course, which is a web application running in Docker. I was working on that last night, but today is a new day. Instead of opening everything from scratch, I can attach to a Tmux session that's running in the background. It already has Vim open with the last file I was editing, along with the entire app running inside of Docker. It's like I never left. I can immediately get back into the thick of it. Next up, let's say I want to do a project-wide search for all the tests in the project. I can do a search for the test underscore string, and Vim will do a fuzzy search and list all the matches. Also, instead of a string, I could have used a regular expression. After that, Vim will present me a way to filter and select matches I want, and even shows a little preview of the file as I cycle through the matches. Uh, my font size is massive here for the sake of the talk, but normally you can see a lot more of the file in the preview. Then from here, I can pick a file, and it opens in the main buffer. If I want to look at multiple files at once, Vim makes it easy to open horizontal and vertical splits. It looks a little cramped here because of that font size. With my normal setup, I can actually fit four 80 character width files side by side on a 2560 by 1440 monitor running at native resolution. Also, I didn't show it here, but it's really easy to switch between different splits using hotkeys with the mouse. That's about uh, one of many awkward drinks for today. Now, let's say that you want to open a different set of files, but you don't want to lose your existing layout of files. With Vim, you can open files in a new tab, and this tab becomes a bucket to hold as many files as you want. Then you can switch between tabs up top using the hotkeys and the mouse. So let's say we did some work, and now it's time to commit our changes. I can hop over to the second Tmux window on the bottom, open a split, and make my get commit message. As an aside, Tmux also supports horizontal and vertical splits. I also like using Vim here for writing commit messages because it helps me adhere to best practices, such as warning me through syntax highlighting if the first line is too long or if I have any typos like we see here. Next up, let's say that you have a few Tmux splits open and you really want to view the log details in full size, but you don't want to close your existing splits. Tmux lets you zoom in and out of any split you want. I'm just hitting a hotkey there to toggle the zoom in and out. Also, it's worth mentioning you can do the same thing with Vim splits too. I didn't show it for the sake of time. Also, as a reminder, we're going to see how to do all of these things later on when we dive into the details. Now, let's say I want to jump to a completely different Tmux session. In this case, it's my podcast site, and maybe I came here to add a reference link or something like that. After doing whatever I needed to do, I can jump over to the second Tmux window on the bottom and deploy the site with Ansible. Ansible's deploy command is kind of long, and I don't want to have to sit there and hit the up arrow 100 times to find it, so I can reverse search my history using the same tool that we saw on Vim to fuzzy search through the files in the project. That tool is called FCF, by the way. Lastly, here's a quick demo of doing GitHub-style markdown previews in Vim. Technically, with this GIF here, it's not real-time since it's not updated on every character press, but you can turn that option on if you want. I, I keep it off for uh, performance reasons. Instead, it updates every time I switch Vim modes or save the file. Also, on the right, Vim puts orange exclamation points near the line count. 
That's to let me know that these lines have changed based on the most recent, uh, recent git commit. It'll show new lines and deleted lines too with different markers as well. Honestly, we could spend the whole hour looking at Vim and Tmux features, but there's so much more to the command line than using Vim. So let's switch gears and go over a few practical examples of using the command line tools. For example, let's say I'm working on something and it sparks an idea for a blog post. I can just run a custom script I created called drafts and start typing whatever I want. After running that command, it automatically creates a date labeled file in my personal website's drafts folder. If I rerun the same command, it opens the file in Vim so I can start fleshing out the draft right now. That's typically what happens in practice. This might seem like such a minor thing, but it really helps remove friction when starting to write new blog posts because the tool I use to build the blog expects files to be in this dated format. Not having to create this file manually means it's one less thing to think about. As for this draft script, it's a simple script and, and don't worry if you can't read the text. Uh, the real takeaway here is the command line is there to help you solve whatever unique problems you have. It's almost like a direct link to your brain, except you have to type what you want instead of think it. In another example, I created a script to toggle dark and light mode for my terminal, Tmux, Vim, and other tools. I prefer using light mode in my day to day, but after running a poll, I found most folks like seeing a dark theme in my video tutorials. So with this script, I can very easily change between the two. It's open source in my public bat files, and we'll take a look at that later. In one more example, let's say I was heading over to New York City later tonight, but I wasn't sure if I needed an umbrella because I live 90 minutes away and weather is crazy like that. Not a problem. I can just run weather NYC and see what it's like there. There's almost a tool for everything. In this case, the weather command is a very simple function I set up in curl, uh, a very simple function I set up to curl wttr.in, which is a website that shows you the weather in a browser, but it's also optimized for displaying the weather on the command line. There's also dozens of general purpose Unix tools that you can use to solve problems around processing and filtering text. I'm not sure if you saw it, but man, this guy's name is really hard to pronounce, but it was something like Yurin Janssens from this group. Uh, he gave a talk about exploring data on the command line a few years ago. I highly recommend checking it out. It's a good primer on a few command line tools. But that said, I'm trying to keep this talk focused on workflows and more generally your dev environments, but Besides using Tmux and Vim, piping together a few Unix commands and writing your own scripts to solve your specific problems is a huge part of using the command line. It becomes another tool at your disposal. With that said, let's take a couple of minutes to go over one example of doing this. So imagine if you have a CSV file with a bunch of transactions in it, and you want to extract down information like how much money you generated, but also have an ability to filter the results by specific product names, date ranges, and so on. The CSV file we're looking at here is a very simplified version of a CSV that my course platform spits out with a bit of anonymized data. In practice, you'll find payment gateways like Stripe and PayPal supplying you transaction information in CSV files, so this is a real world use case. As an aside, Vim has a plugin to help view and display CSV data, and we'll go over that a bit later. But viewing this data isn't super useful. Typically, I want to figure out things like how many courses were sold this month with an ability to filter the results by course name and so on. And that begins with removing the CSV headers. SED stands for stream editor, and in practice, it's a very useful tool for doing a find and replace in text. But in this case, we're using it to delete the first line of the file. The 1D part stands for delete the first line. If we swapped out the 1 with a 2, then the first two lines would be deleted instead. One neat thing about the command line is there's often more, one, more than one way to do something. If you Googled around for how to delete the first line in a file, you'll find all sorts of different answers, and most of them will probably work. For example, we could have used the tail command and passed in these flags to get the same exact result. Technically, tail is faster than set on Linux, but apparently it's slower on macOS by default, at least according to Stack Overflow. Although I find the tail version to be less readable for this type of use case. It's really confusing because the plus one actually outputs the entire file, so we need to offset what we want by one. And there's also very subtle differences between using one and plus one. One takeaway here is you should probably be mindful of performance, but readability almost always wins, especially if the performance difference isn't anything worth considering. For example, if we had thousands of rows and the said version finished in five milliseconds, but the tail version finished in three milliseconds, it doesn't really matter for a script that I run once a month on my dev box. But I will remember what 1D does in said three months from now, which has way more value in the end. As an aside, tail is still a great tool. If we wanted to get the last line or last couple of lines of the file, then tail is for sure the way to go here. You can even have tail watch a file for changes in real time and output new lines as they come in. 
that could be useful for monitoring web uh, application logs. But moving on, before uh, we're going to be using the said version, and the next thing we'll want to do is filter out a specific column of text. This column is the net amount of sense, and it's the thing we want to sum up in the end. Unix was invented a long time ago, and they made some really great design decisions, such as being able to pipe the output of one program as input into another. And you'll also find that text streams are the protocol that most commands use. That means most command line tools expect text as input and produce text as output. This is remarkably powerful because suddenly it means you can combine hundreds of tools in a number of different ways to solve very specific problems that you might have. And Unix pipes are the secret sauce that lets us send the output of one program as input to another. Pipes are defined with this vertical line, and you can see it here sitting in between set and cut. That means in this case, the output of the set command is now being fed in as input to the cut command. And this cut command is going to delimit the output by a comma, since this is a CSV file, and we want to grab the fifth column, which is the net amount in cents. If we ever wanted to calculate the transaction fees for a specific payment gateway, then we could change this five to a four, and now it would get the previous column, which are those fees. And this is why the command line tools are amazing. We get to break down the problem into bite-sized chunks and then work on only a very specific tiny problem at hand. I think this fits the functional programming model very nicely. Speaking of which, a lot of functional programming languages also have the idea of a pipe operator, where you can send the output of a function as input to another function. It's a great way to break up a problem. Next up, let's say that uh, we have a list of amounts. We'll want to sum them up, but before we can sum them, we need to transform the list of numbers into a math equation that adds each value. For that, there's the paste command. Uh, don't ask me why it's named paste, because I have no idea. Uh, it has nothing to do with your clipboard. All I know is when we use these flags, it becomes what we see here. If you wanted to do something else, like subtract the values, you can replace the plus at the end with a hyphen. Technically, you can use this paste tool for anything. It's not limited to math. If we put an underscore there instead, it would delimit them by that. By the way, the dash D is the delimiter and slash or dash S puts everything onto one line. And now we have our equation ready to go and we can use the basic calculator command, AKA the BC command to sum them all up. And there we go. We solved our problem by piping together a few commands. In practice, when you're more familiar with these commands, you can create pipelines like this in a few minutes. By the way, there's gotcha here with the BC command too. If you ever want to support floating point numbers, you'll need to add the dash L flag to it. I didn't add it here since we're dealing with summing whole numbers, so there's never going to be a decimal point. Next up, let's filter the results by a specific course using the grep tool. This tool you'll likely find yourself using all the time. You can provide it a text stream or a file, and then we can match whatever search string we want. In our case, it's a regular expression that makes sure our comma BSAWF is at the very end of the file. That's just uh, like an identifier for build a SAS apple flask, the name of one of my courses. Uh, this is nice because it means we no longer need to use the set command to chop out the first line since this grep pattern will only ever match CSV rows that have this specific text. Then from here, we can use what we did before to sum up the net sales. And suddenly we have the total sales for a specific course. I also decided to throw in two more examples here at the end. The first one lets us count the number of sales for a spe uh, specific month. Here, we just take the output of what grep produces and pipe it into the word count command. The dash L flag counts the number of lines instead of words. Alternatively, grep has a dash C flag to get a count of the results instead of returning each match on a new line. In practice, I would use the second command if I wanted to count. It's less typing, less overhead, and more straightforward to read. So that's a mini crash course in combining a couple of commands together to solve a real world problem. The cool thing is if you find yourself writing scripts like this, then uh, you know, if they start to get a bit unwieldy, you can put them into a dedicated script file and run them like that. We'll talk more about shell scripts a bit later. Yeah, there's no reasonable way to drink stuff on a Zoom call. <laughs> and now that leads us into the next part of this talk. We just covered a bunch of practical workflows and examples of using the command line. Now it's time to get into the details about setting up your dev environment. And that begins with picking a terminal and configuring your shell. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on this because it's pretty core to your environment. The interesting thing about Tmux is it gives you tabs, splits, and a way to search up and down a buffer in any terminal. This allows us to pick a terminal that focuses on speed and having the least amount of input latency when you press keys. You can also optimize for quality of life enhancements too, like having customizable hotkeys, being able to zoom in and out, being able to click URLs, and also have solid Unicode support for displaying icons and emojis. If you're gonna be spending a lot of time typing into something, it should feel really good and make you happy while doing it. 
For example, I'm using Windows and the Microsoft terminal has really low key press latency. It's like night and day compared to most other terminals on Windows. I tried a whole bunch and the only other terminal I found that was really good was WSLTTY, but I've gone with the Microsoft terminal because it's more integrated with being able to easily switch between WSL distros. Hmm. As for anyone running native Linux, Xterm is a very lightweight terminal and has pretty much the lowest input latency I've ever encountered on any OS. Also, with a bit of configuration, it hits all the marks on the quality of life improvements. I do run native Linux on a modified Chromebook, and I'm always amazed at how nice the uh, terminal experience is. For Mac OS, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure since I have no first-hand experience, but I've heard that iTerm2 is pretty solid, so you may want to start there. In addition to that, there's cross-platform terminals like Alacrity, which is something you may want to check out too, but personally on Windows and Linux, I've always used the Microsoft terminal and Xterm. And I think the takeaway here is it doesn't matter too much in which terminal you pick because Tmux brings a lot to the table. So just stack up on speed and quality of life improvements, and I wouldn't worry too much about native terminal support for things like tabs, splits, and searching. Next up, it's time to pick a shell, and your shell provides a command line interface to your operating system. It's both interactive and can be used as a scripting language. Right now, I happen to be running Bash, and you can check what shell you're currently using by running echo dollar sign zero. There's also dollar sign shell too, but this is technically the default shell for your system or user, not your current shell. To help clarify that, another shell is SH, which is the born shell, and it was released way back in 1979. If you're curious, its accessor, Bash, stands for the born again shell, and that was released about 10 years later in 1989. But just because I'm running Bash here doesn't mean I can't use the original born shell. You can run it by running SH. Notice the prompt changed, and now dollar sign zero returns SH instead of Bash. But dollar sign shell still returns Bash because for my NIC user in the system, Bash is set as a default. Typically on modern systems, you wouldn't use SH as your interactive shell in your day-to-day. -day. It's missing very nice to have features like being able to tap complete commands or use the arrow keys to move the cursor around. However, when writing shell script, it's often a good idea to target your scripts for the shell since it's the most compatible across systems. Although there's not too much harm in targeting Bash 2 because it's available on most Linux systems and Mac OS. We'll talk about shell scripting in a bit, but for now, let's focus on the shells themselves. Any questions so far in the chat, if you want to relay some? Uh, you are good to go. There's a few things about, you know, talking about Bat, who, who maintains Bash, stuff like that, but you're, you're good to go. Okay, cool. Yeah, as for who maintains Bash, not really sure. Probably some guy with a very long beard, but uh, Brian we'll see Lewis, about that. Brian Lewis saying it's Chet Ramey. Right. He's Cleveland. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So besides SH and Bash, there's also a newer shell such as Z shell, which is labeled as ZSH. Just like Bash extended the original born shell, Z shell extends Bash. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of it, but it's not because I think it's bad or I have anything against it. I'm just content with Bash and I don't really feel like I'm missing out on anything at the moment. By the way, it's worth pointing out if you're running a modern version of Mac OS and you followed along before with a dollar sign zero command, chances are you saw Z shell as your shell. That's because macOS made it the default shell in the Catalina release, which I think was in 2019. But even so, Bash is still available to be run on macOS. And there's also Fish, which is an even more recent shell, and it stands for Friendly Interactive Shell. Unlike Z Shell, Fish is not compatible with SH or Bash because the creators thought certain design decisions from back in the day were kind of poorly designed, so they went their own way. Honestly, this shell isn't for me, mainly due to that lack of compatibility, but it might be, it might be okay for you uh, it has a lot of out-of-the-box features like auto-suggestions, but you can also get that to work with other shells too. It just takes a bit more effort. With that said, at least now you know these options exist. We only have so much time here, so we can't spend a ton of time breaking down the pros and cons of each shell, but overall, your shell is there to make it a pleasant experience to use your system from the command line. If you're curious, now you could Google for things like bash versus ZSH versus fish, and you can make an informed decision. Just be aware that this is an excellent topic to get lost in yak shaving or bike shedding, in other words, you can spend a lot of time here and wind up with uh, not too many gains. The real gains come from learning how to create tools that help you solve your exact problems and getting comfy with workflows that let you do whatever you need to do quickly. It's not a life or death decision, e decision either. You can always switch your shell later on without too much fush. Uh, so that's a basic rundown of shells. Since I happen to use Bash, let's go over how I have it configured. 
Although in a lot of cases, even if you plan to use Z shell or fish, most of what we're about to cover still applies. Uh, most shells have a few config files in your home directory. With bash, you'll have at least a bash RC file and maybe a bash profile too. In my case, I decided to rename my bash profile to profile so it'll work with any shell. Although technically this profile file has one line in it that's specific to bash, so it's not entirely portable across all shells. With that said, let's take a look at this file. Just a heads up before we get into this, I'm only going to be showing a few lines at a time so it's easier to talk about. This entire file, along with all of my config files, are in my .files repo on GitHub, and we'll cover that near the end. As for this profile file, it runs once when you log into your system, so it's a very good spot to put things that don't change very often. For example, I modify my path here so that any executable scripts or binaries that exist in my home directory's .local bin directory are available to run without supplying the entire path. That's how I ran the draft script before, uh, it exists in my local bin directory, and I can run it like any other command that's already on my system path. This is also where I like to set the uh, system defaults for certain tools that I use. The editor variable controls which text editor to open. For example, if a tool needs to open a text editor, it opens vim by default due to this being set. The editor variable is a standard, so a bunch of tools know how to read from it. We saw that before when I wrote a git commit message, get new to open vim due to the setting. You can also choose to set your own variables here if you want. I really like this pattern because it means your settings are stored in one spot. If 10 different tools decided to open your default text editor, it means you only need to change this variable in one spot if you wanted to do something else. Next up, there's a bunch of configuration to use syntax highlighting in certain tools like less and man, and the man command opens a reference manual for many different tools. For example, if you run man grep, it will open the manual for grep. This is a really good uh, way to learn about a specific tool. You can also see their syntax highlighting Without those environment variables we just saw, this would all be one solid color, which is a bit harder to read. Lastly, this line does the $0 trick, which we did before, to see what shell we're running. And then if we're running bash and we have a bashrc file present, it sources that file. Sourcing it basically means running the script and any shell related changes will take effect in your current shell. If you're running Z shell or fish, then you'd want to modify this last line. Next up, let's take a look at the bashrc file. For the sake of time, I'm going to try to keep things brief rather than go into the gory details of everything. This file executes every time you start a new terminal session. That means every time you open a new terminal window or spawn a new Tmax window, this bash RC file is going to run top to bottom. The first five settings control your history. Basically, we want to save the last 50,000 lines of history, ensure each line has its own timestamp, avoid adding duplicate or empty lines, and also append to the history file instead of rewriting a new file on every entry. Your, your history is saved in your home directory. With bash, it'll be in the bash history file. Mine is nearly empty now because prior to this talk, I backed up my real history file so I didn't have to worry about showing sensitive commands during this talk. You know, some of them contain information about client work and I didn't want to leak those out by accident. Speaking of history, you can also take a look at your history by running the history command. That's useful to find commands you've run in the past and with saving 50,000 entries, Chances are you'll be able to find commands you've run months ago. But grepping through this output would be kind of painful. So bash provides the control R keyboard shortcut to reverse search your bash history. We'll go over that in more detail once we encounter a different part of this bash RC file. The next couple of settings are default values of the bash RC file. It's not really worth spending any time on them, but I included them here anyways. Although it is worth mentioning that on a Linux system, you can check out what the default bash rc file is by cutting out slash etsy skill that bash rc. That comes in really handy if you're tweaking your bash rc file and just want to double check the default value. Also in the scale directory, there's a couple of other default configs that you can take a look at if you're curious. Next up, we have aliases, and these are really, really useful. The basic idea here is if an aliases file exists, then we load it in. There's two files here because my dot files are public on GitHub. And I wanted the option to have a local aliases file that's ignored from version control. This local file contains aliases that are only ever going to be useful to me and are super specific to private files on my file system. You know, things like accessing client projects and uh, other stuff. With that said, let's take a look at the regular aliases file, which by the way in bash would be named bash underscore aliases by default. I decided to go with aliases to make it a bit more portable across different shells. It still works as aliases because it's tied into the file being sourced from the bash rc file we just looked at. Technically, we can name this file anything we want, as long as it matches up with what we just saw. The first couple of aliases are defined by default. 
It's mainly for enabling colors and popular commands like ls and grep, but it also includes a very popular one called ll. I use this one all the time to list directories and files. My uh, real aliases file has over 20 different functions and aliases, but we could legit spend the next two hours going over it. But instead, I just want to focus on the big picture here. In my aliases file, you'll notice there's both functions and aliases, and uh, both allow you to access the function or alias as if it were a script on your system path. If you plan to pass in arguments like you see here, then you would use a function, otherwise you can use an alias. For example, with the weather commands, we can pass in a city, zip code, or nothing, and it all works the same. The dollar sign one ends up being the value you passed in. If it's empty, then it's treated as an empty string. But in this case, we have an alias that takes no arguments, and we saw this command being run during the demo. Instead of it just running the script on its own, it also sources the bash RC file because it ends up changing the color of a specific tool that depends on bash being reloaded. That's kind of a neat trick because the alias and script both have the same name. In this case, the alias takes precedence over the script's path. The takeaway here is don't be afraid to create aliases that help you in your day to day. You should try to mold your dev environment to fit your exact needs. I think there's really a whole mindset or philosophy around that, especially when it comes to using Linux. With the amount of configuration you can do, it really becomes an OS that you can customize for you. One day I'll switch to native Linux, and the only reason I don't do that now is because I had some audio trouble with some of my hardware. I bet if I were running native Linux for the last 10 years, I would probably have like 5 million aliases and uh, custom strips to help me in my day to day. Anyways, that is it for aliases. The next part of my bash RC file is related to the prompt, and we haven't really gone over that yet. So let's quickly do that before we see how it's configured. My prompt doesn't look like the bridge of the USS Enterprise, and this really comes down to personal preference. I much prefer a minimal prompt that gets out of my way and lets me focus on the commands I'm running and the output of those commands. But I do like to see some information in my prompt. For example, as we saw earlier, if you're in a Git repo, it will show the branch name, which I find to be quite handy. Beyond that, I also like to see the current directory of where I am, since that's pretty important as well. Also, if I SSH into one of my production servers, I like to configure the prompt there to be read to remind myself that I probably shouldn't copy paste commands from the internet here or start running a bunch of commands without thinking. Uh, I don't drink much, but if I did, seeing this red color would be a last resort reminder to hopefully prevent myself from deleting a production database in a drunken rage, but uh, no promises. One takeaway here is all of these command line tools are super configurable. If you don't like my basic prompt and you'd rather have a more busy prompt with emojis, rainbows, seeing your battery of life or hard drive space on every line, that's totally cool and you can do that. I've linked to a few resources in the Git repo on projects that help you customize your prompt in different ways. With that said, let's see how to configure your prompt, aka your PS1, which stands for primary prompt string. This syntax looks like total insanity, and it kind of is, but there is a silver lining. Once you have it set up, you never have to worry about it again until you get bored and want to change things around. Uh, we can spend an hour here easy, but here's a low-hanging fruit. Bash provides a bunch of special characters, such as slash u and slash h. These are special variables that translate to specific things. In the case of slash u, that's your username, and slash h is the host of the machine. In my case, my username is Nick, and I need my computer kit. If you're old enough to remember Knight Rider, you'll get that reference. There's also this slash w hidden amongst the sea of backslashes. Uh, that's the current working directory, which is temp in this case. There's also a number of other special variables too. They're mostly maybe uh, related to the date. I've dropped a link to the bash manual in the references if you're curious. Now, besides those special variables, most of the other characters in this PS1 are related to outputting color. These are called ANSI escape codes, and it's kind of where the insanity begins. It's not that it's a terrible system, it's just that it requires a lot of escaping and also resetting colors back to the default color after you've picked a color. That's why you see uh, zero, 00 entries, that's the reset code. As for picking colors, if you Google around for ANSI color chart, you'll find a bunch of examples. I usually go to Wikipedia for it, but that page has too much to show in one slide, so I made a more readable chart. Here, we can see a list of valid colors. FG is foreground and BG is background. If you remember, my username and host were green, so that would be foreground color 32. And if we go back to the previous slide, here we can see 32 set for the username and host. We can also see that 34 is set for the working directory, which is blue. And if we jump back to the chart again, there we can see 34 is blue. Now, there is a variation of these colors called bright mode. 
As far as I know, there are more than one way to uh, set these colors. Honestly, a lot of this stuff is black magic to me. I just copy paste things and tweak it until I'm happy. But as for bright mode, notice how there is a zero one before the 32 and 34. To my knowledge, that flips on bright mode for the color being set. If you set that to zero zero instead, it would be the regular version of the color. Apparently, an alternative way to set that is to add 60 to the value. So 32 becomes 92 and 34 becomes 94. Keep in mind that all terminals and themes are created equal, so you may see different results depending on what you use. But here's a modified chart to show how bright colors could look using Xterm with the default theme. Also, my prompt only modifies the foreground color of text, but you can set the background color too. Uh, I'm going to leave that one up to you if you want to research it. You'll be able to find lots of examples if you Google around. As for the command separator, it's pretty standard to end your prompt with a dollar sign. Uh, this will end up being the character that separates your prompt with whatever command you're running. Some folks like to use Unicode characters or an emoji. Years ago, I used a lightning bolt, but eventually grew bored of it. But don't let me talk to you about using something else. I really do encourage you to mold your prompt and dev environment to whatever you like. Uh, if you did want to swap out the dollar sign, it's just a matter of replacing it here at the end. As for this prompt, the last component is getting the git branch wedged in near the end. The basic idea is we execute a function here, and the output of that function ends up in its place. That function is defined in the middle here, and all it does is grab the current branch. Uh, then it uses sed to replace some characters that git usually outputs when you run the git branch command. Also, if the command fails, we redirect all errors to dev null, which means if we're not in a git repo, we end up with no output, which exactly is what we want. Honestly, it's not too important to go through this function in detail. I'm pretty sure I sniped that from Stack Overflow like seven years ago, and it still works great today. Uh, there's other more fancy Git integrations that you can add to, such as outputting specific characters, depending on the state of stage files, or if a file is different than what has been commit. But in practice, I don't really find that to be that useful. Typically, that information can be obtained in your code editor or using Git commands when you're ready to commit something. But the branch is very nice to see because being on the wrong branch can cause all sorts of confusion. And typically while you're launching Vim or another editor, you're already actively looking at your prompt. So the branch is nice to see there. Okay, that's the prompt. Uh, any questions so far? Or I'll just keep going and you just jump in if there are. So the next bit here updates the terminal's window title depending on which directory you're in. This only works if your terminal supports it, but it's part of the default bash RC file. So it's not super important to go over. And every time I drink, I'm laughing to myself because it just looks so dumb. Okay, so next up we have ASDF, which is a tool that helps you manage programming language versions in a consistent way. It's not super important to cover that now since it mainly relates to installing specific programming languages. Although the Vim plugin for previewing markdown files does require having Node installed. And I do use ASDF to install Node and we'll talk more about this later. Next up, there's FCF, which is a command line fuzzy finder. We saw this in action during the demo when searching through a project in Vim, as well as the command history. This tool replace, replaces the default behavior for reverse searching your history and makes it a lot better. Searching your history is a really important part of using the command line. So let's spend a minute or two going over how to do this and how FCF improves the experience. When you hit Control R and bash without FCF, you'll get a menu that looks like this. The basic idea is you can start typing the first few characters of any command you want, and it'll start showing you matches based on what you've run in the past. In this case, I'm searching for the characters BS. If there's multiple commands that start with these characters, you can cycle through them by hitting Control R as many times as you want. It's called the reverse search because it returns the last command that matches. In other words, it searches your history in reverse. This is one of the most useful things ever. Uh, it sure beats hitting the up arrow 42 times in a row to find some command you ran three days ago. I use this feature probably 100 times a day. Uh, you can pick the command you want to run by hitting enter and it'll populate the command for you. So in the above case, all I did was hit control R, search for the BS characters, and then hit enter. All in all, this takes about two seconds and it's very practical. By the way, you can also cancel your reverse search by hitting control C if you don't want to pick anything. Now, when you use FCF, control R is still available to run, except now it looks like this. Then as you start typing, it narrows down the result in real time. In this case, only commands that contain the C character are returned. It's also a fuzzy search, meaning if I instead searched for the L character, it would have found the second match since clear has an L in it. It ranks them based on what it thinks is the best match. 
it's really good. I would say probably, I don't know, 99% of the time, it picks the command in one after typing a few characters, even if it's searching through hundreds of files. In the 1% case when it fails, it's really no biggie. I just type one or two more characters and it always finds it. After hitting enter to pick the item, it'll inject the command into your prompt and then you can choose to run it. You can also hit control C to cancel it, just like we did with control R before. FCF can also do a lot more than search your history too. You can use it to search your process list and more. To be honest, it deserves its own 45 minute talk. It's a really useful tool. But now that we know how to search our history efficiently, let's go back to the bash RC file. We saw these lines a few minutes ago. This controls enabling uh, and configuring FCF. The bottom line enables FCF and the two optional lines above it configure it. FCF supports both dark and light themes and you can also customize the colors individually however you see fit. But the line above that is a bit more interesting to talk about. It configures FCF with a tool called RipGrep instead of the grep tool when it searches for matches. RipGrep is a much faster version of grep. Now, in practice, I use grep in the command line because it's fast enough, but fuzzy searching is pretty demanding, and I find rip grep speed, bo speed boost to be worth it. It narrows down search results pretty much as fast as you can type, even with hundreds of files. This is really important because the Vim plugin for FCF will use rip grep when searching for files to open or searching your project for a specific text. During the demo, I ran the rg command, which uses rip grep under the hood and fed the results into FCF. Installing RipGrep is easy because every major operating system has a version of it in its package manager. But I recommend holding off on installing it for now because there's a couple of tools covered in my bash RC file and we we'll want to install them and it's going to be a lot easier to do that in one place when we take a look at our dot files. And finally, there's a bit of configuration uh, related to WSL2 and WSL1. This is mainly to set up a next server display so you can have your clipboard shared between WSL and regular Windows as well as run graphical apps. I don't want to really spend any time on this one, but if you're using WSL, the references link has a link to a video that goes over this in more detail. So that's how I have Bash configured. I know it was a lot to take in, but we really just condensed multiple months of research in about 10 minutes or however long that uh, section took. Now, before we get into using Tmux, I do want to cover one last thing that's important when writing your own scripts. When writing shell scripts, you might have seen something like what we see here. This is called a shebang, and it's the first line of the file that starts with pound exclamation point, followed by a path to some type of binary such as sh, bash, or any programming runtime that can be called from the command line. You, <clears throat> you may have also seen the style of a shebang, which technically works on most systems, but it's less portable. It's considered less portable because the bash binary might not exist in slash bin on some systems. Whereas uh, user bin ENV exists almost everywhere. I tend to use this style everywhere unless I made a mistake and used a less portable version by accident. Speaking of portability, remember when we talked about using sh instead of bash for scripting? Uh, the born shell, aka sh, is POSIX compliant. And this is a standard that was created to ensure compatibility between different operating systems. To write a POSIX compliant shell script, you would reference sh instead of bash. In practice, I tried to do that, but sometimes you really need the extra features provided by bash, in which case I would use bash without giving it a second thought. Honestly, we could spend another hour here going over the subtle differences between the two, so let's just leave it at that. You can always Google for the differences later. With that said, I think one of the best ways to learn something is to see fully working examples. So I've dropped a couple of links into the references to a number of scripts I've open sourced over the years to help me in my day to day. I'm not saying it's the best code ever written, but it might get your noodle cooking to see what types of problems you can solve in the command line. All of the code is MIT licensed too. So that's shells and scripting in a nutshell. On that note, we covered a lot, but don't feel compelled to learn everything up front before you do anything. You can slowly introduce things on a need to know basis. What I mean by that is like any programming language or environment, you can still be very productive without understanding the entire language and ecosystem in detail. Next up, let's go over using Tmux. Unlike the shell, we'll spend the majority of our time using Tmux instead of configuring it, but we will take a look at some config settings too. First up, what is Tmux? Good question, I'm glad you asked. Tmux is a terminal multiplexer, and what that means is it lets you create and control multiple terminals from a single screen. We saw that before in the demo when creating windows and splits. It also lets you create sessions, which, can, which you can attach to and detach from, which is amazing because it means if you close your terminal, 
everything will still be running in the background and you can connect to any session at any time to resume where you left off. You'll find Tmux in whatever package manager your operating system uses, so it's going to be no problem to install. But like before, let's not worry about installing it and uh, we'll take a look at that later. For now, let's just focus on using it. Uh, one core feature of Tmux is its ability to control most things with hotkeys, but don't worry, you can still use the mouse for most things like selecting text, clicking between different windows or split panes. But since Tmux is so hotkey driven, they introduced the idea of a thing called a prefix key. The basic idea is you'll hit this key along with some other key afterwards to perform a specific action. This helps namespace all of your Tmux hotkeys so you don't end up overriding hotkeys from other tools. I tend to call this a leader key because that's what Vim defines it as, so you may hear me use both terms interchangeably. By default, it's bound to control B, which is in my opinion a bit funky to hit, so I've remapped my prefix key to be the back tick. That's usually under the escape key or to the left of a one on a standard keyboard. In practice, you'll find that lots of folks use this key. It's pretty easy to access and you really type it in your day to day. And uh, when you do need to insert a back tick somewhere, you can just hit the key twice. It's really no problem. Throughout the rest of this section, I'll always reference hotkeys with the word prefix instead of using the back tick directly since you could in theory use a different key. By default, when you open a new terminal, tmux is not going to be running. So we need to run it manually by running the tmux command. After running it, you'll, after running it, you'll know you're inside a tmux because you'll see a status bar on the bottom of your terminal. Out of the box, the status bar is going to look a bit different than what we see here, and we'll go over how to configure that later on. I made mine pretty minimal just to maximize usable space while giving me just enough information I care about. From here, we have access to a bunch of tmux goodies. For example, if you hit prefix C, you can create a new window. Notice on the bottom, we have two windows now instead of one, and both of them are named bash because that's the shell I'm running. So let's say we've opened up a couple of windows like we see here, and it starts to get confusing because we're not sure what's running in each window. If you hit prefix comma, tmux will bring up its command mode, and now we can rename the window by typing in whatever you want as a new name. And there we can see hello world. You can also switch to a different window by hitting leader two or whatever number you want to switch to. The window you're currently looking at will have a star next to it, which makes it easy to identify at a glance. By default, tmux will order windows starting at zero, but in my tmux config, I changed it to start at one because in my opinion, it's a lot easier to hit backtick one rather than backtick zero. Also, if you have mouse mode enabled, you can click any one of those windows on the bottom to switch to it. And yeah, I do have mouse mode enabled, uh, just as an aside, like I do use a mouse a pretty decent amount of the time, especially for recording videos. Also, as another aside, uh, I'm not trying to cover every single Tmux feature ever. Uh, there's other ways to switch between Windows 2, but I'm trying to focus on what you might use in your day-to-day. -day. Now, Tmux has a help menu that you can bring up with a prefix question mark to learn about its binds, and that's what we see here. Uh, the funny thing is, is I zoomed out to try to fit this all in one screenshot, but there's still about half a dozen lines above this. And uh, there's also the man pages too, and plenty of cheat sheets available if you Google around. With that said, I included a link to a cheat sheet in the references. And yeah, you're not meant to read this by the way. <laughs> so going back to our example before, uh, if you wanna split a window in half, you can use prefix B to open a split below you, but that's not the default bind. Instead, I made it match the same bindings as Vim. And there's really no limit to how many times you can split a window. You're basically limited to your monitor screen resolution. In practice, I do use split panes all the time, and you can switch between them with the mouse, or if you use my Tmux config, you can also use the up or alt up or down arrows, depending on which direction you want to go. Alternatively, you can also split your windows vertically. This time around, you can do prefix V, which also matches uh, my Vim keybinds. Also, while I'm not showing it here, you can combine horizontal and vertical splits together. You can even drag the bar around with your mouse to resize the panes. Uh, there's also resizing hotkeys for that too, but personally, I don't use them, and I don't even know what they are off the top of my head. Next up, if you do find yourself having a bunch of splits open, but you want to temporarily zoom into one of them without closing the rest of your splits, you can do that with prefix Z. You can tell if you zoomed in because it'll show a Z next to the window name. This is something I do all the time. Uh, it's especially handy if you're creating video tutorials with a large font size, uh, yeah, and when you want to just want to zoom into a specific split, but I still do use this in my day to day with a regular font size too. Now, there's a lot more we can do with windows and panes, but this goes back to the 80 20 rule, which is basically focusing on the 80%, which is going to give you the most benefit versus how much time you spend. In other words, we just covered, uh, goes, in other words, what we just covered goes a really long ways for dealing with windows 
and split panes. Next up, let's go over another killer feature of TMX, which are sessions. If you hit prefix D, that's going to detach you from your current session. We didn't go over this yet, but when we run, uh, ran TMUX before, it started a session for us behind the scenes and it named that session zero since we didn't define a name. That means if we close our terminal, we could reattach to it and things will be back as if we never left. If we ever forget what's running, we can use the TMUX ls command to get a list of sessions. In our case, we have just the one here. Then if we run the attach command, along with a specific session name, we can attach to that specific session. Right now our session is named zero, but we can choose to rename it to something else, which we'll do in a few. Also, it's worth pointing out that if you run tmux attach with no arguments, it'll attach you to the last used session, which is something I do all the time. After running that attach command, we're back to our session from before. It's like we never left. What's really useful is you can have multiple sessions running at once and switch between them all. That's a game changer if you have a terminal focused development environment. Speaking of multiple sessions, if you're already in tmux, uh, already in a tmux session, you can create a new session by running prefix colon to bring up command mode, and then you can run the new session command. I'm passing it in a custom session name of cool here, but you can name it whatever you want. Technically, you can make a new session without naming it, but I find in practice that naming your sessions is worth it, especially when you're dealing with a few sessions. As for this animation, right after the session is created, we can see that we're put into a new session with only one window, but our old session is still running in the background. Also, if you're curious, most commands that you can run in command mode can also be run directly on the command line. Although in this case, if you try to create a new session like this when already in a session, tmux is going to prevent you from doing it by default. Otherwise, it gets too crazy with nested sessions. However, when you run new session in command mode, that doesn't nest the new session within an existing session. It creates a completely separate one. I know that's a little confusing, uh, but that's just how it is as far as I know. The takeaway here is you should always spawn new sessions from command mode if you're already inside an, uh, a tmux session. As for switching between sessions, you can hit prefix s. This gives you a list of all of your sessions, and then you can use the arrow keys to pick the one that you want and switch to it and hit enter to select it. Upon doing so, you'll be put into that session immediately. Uh, what's really cool is as you cycle through the list of sessions, you'll get to see a preview of what's running in the lower half of the window. That could be very handy to see what's running in a session. You can even click directly into uh, one of those boxes there and jump straight into that window. Next up, let's say that you wanna search up and down your buffer. With the way I have things configured, you can use the mouse wheel to scroll up in your buffer and that puts you into TMUX's copy mode. You can then, I, you can identify that by the orange label in the top right, which shows the number of lines in the buffer. Then you can hit the forward slash to begin searching, type in whatever term that you want, in this case it's tmux, and then hit enter. From there, tmux will highlight all the matches and you can jump to the next one by pressing N or go to the previous one with shift N. And this is what I meant by super, uh, tmux supercharging your terminal. Suddenly we can do this with any terminal and that's awesome. Now, with the way I have things configured, if you select any text with the mouse and let go of the mouse button, it'll copy that text to your clipboard. That's due to using a tmux plugin called Yank. You can even use the mouse wheel or the page up and down keys to quickly select a bunch of text that is multiple pages long. Copy pasting is a pretty common thing to do, and I'm sure you'll be using that one all the time. I know I do. Next up, it's worth pointing out that if you open two separate terminals, you actually can connect to both of them uh, to the same session. When you do this, your actions are going to be mirrored in both terminals. That includes both typing and switching windows. By default, tmux will also resize the viewport of both terminals to be whatever the smaller one is. To be honest, I'm actually not too sure why it does that, but uh, you can change the behavior. For example, if you attach to the session like this, along with setting one config option, then you can connect to the same session, but each terminal will have its own independent view of a specific window. This is very, very handy if you have multiple monitors. It means you can have a second terminal open on your other monitor and look at a different window on the same session that's running on your main monitor. I do this quite often when I'm working on projects that require seeing many things at once. Lastly, let's say that you're detaching or you're detached from tmux and you want to stop all of your sessions. You can do that by running the tmux kill server command. That's going to completely kill tmux, destroy all of your sessions, and stop any processes that were running in the foreground inside of tmux. This could be handy if you get lazy and not uh, name your sessions after a few weeks of using tmux without rebooting, and you wind up with having 20 unnamed sessions and 50 copies of vim running. Been there, done that. As for rebooting, by default, you'll lose all of your sessions after you reboot. On Linux, that's not really too bad because you might not reboot for six months, but on Windows, 
Well, that's a little bit painful because Windows will decide to reboot your machine whenever it feels like. Uh, but there is a silver lining. There's a plugin called Tmux Resurrect that will let you save and restore your sessions after a reboot or killing the Tmux server. With that said, let's quickly go over a few interesting parts of my Tmux config. For the sake of time, we're not going to really spend as much time as you did going over the shell-related configs. Also, my config is pretty well commented, so it should be fairly easy for you to take a look at on more detail on your own. Like the other config files, uh, we'll show a little bit at a time, and this is how you could customize your prefix key. There's really not much to it. If you wanted to use something other than the backtick, you would change it here. Next up, this one is super interesting. This is the setting that allows you to get independent windows when connecting to the same session multiple times. Apparently, resizing isn't enough. You need to aggressively resize to get your independence. These settings control the status bar. I explicitly removed everything except showing the windows numbers and labels. Uh, by default, Tmux shows a clock on the bottom right-hand side of the status bar, and I have that disabled here with comments. Now, if you Google around for Tmux status bar configuration, you'll find a bunch of examples on what you can do. For example, you can add things like, uh, you know, your network IP address and battery life and things like that. You know, that could be handy if you're connecting to multiple remote machines, especially for the IP address. Uh, these settings work together to make Tmux a bit more human friendly. For example, if you had four windows and you closed window two, then Tmux by default will leave a numbered gap. What I mean by that is you would end up with windows one, three, and four being available. The first setting removes the gaps, so you would end up with windows one, two, and three. The other settings on the bottom make Tmux start numbering windows at one instead of zero. Next up, you can quickly reload your Tmux config by hitting prefix R. That's handy to do if you're tweaking your Tmux config and you want to see the changes without having to kill your Tmux server. This is very similar to sourcing your bash RC file to see the changes without having to open a new terminal. Lastly, Tmux has plugins and the tool to manage them is called TPM. That stands for Tmux Plugin Manager. Manage, oh wow, how did I mess that one up? That stands for Tmux Plugin Management. Wow, manager, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Uh, it's something you'll need to install and it's included in my .files documentation. Uh, the Yank plugin copies selected text to your clipboard. And the Resurrect plugin lets you save and restore Tmux sessions even if your Tmux server dies. And you can do that by hitting prefix control S to save your sessions and prefix control R to restore them once you're inside of any Tmux session. And that's really all you have to do. This plugin is awesome, especially if you're on Windows. Now, let's talk a little bit about Vim. Unlike the Tmux session, this is going to be more like a rapid fire description of a bunch of Vim plugins that I use in my day to day. That's because to really get into Vim would require its own dedicated talk instead of a couple of minutes. If you're curious, I do have over 15 videos on YouTube covering a bunch of Vim topics. I've linked to them in the reference notes. Uh, lastly, I do run regular Vim, not NeoVim, but all of these plugins will work with Vim 8.1 or above and NeoVim. Speaking of plugins, we'll need a tool to install them. The Vim has many different choices for how to install plugins since it's been around for so long. The one I use is called Plug, and you'll see how to install it once we get to the .files section, and that's coming up next. Uh, none of these plugins are in any specific order, but let's start with the ones that we've seen during this talk. All the code snippets you see here are straight from my Vim config file. As for FCF, it allows us to fuzzy search files, text, git commits, and more. It's one of my favorite plugins. Fern allows you to quickly visualize your project's directory structure, and it makes it really easy to rename, copy, or delete files and directories. Now, it even supports bulk renaming files in a Vim buffer for doing complex renaming. That could come in really handy if you want to reorganize how you label media files or whatever you might be doing. Next up, Signify is a super efficient plugin for displaying Git changes like we saw during the Markdown preview demo. You know, that's when we get a chance to see the orange exclamation point. It also uses a green plus sign for new lines and a red dash for deleted lines. Then, for previewing Markdown, I use this plugin. It's labeled as being for NeoVim because it ends there with uh, .nvim, but it still works with Vim 8.1 or above. This is the plugin that requires having Node installed. Also, we saw uh, this plugin display markdown that looks like GitHub styles, but you can easily change that by swapping out a CSS file in case you decide that you want to use GitLab, Bitbucket, or you just want your markdown to look different. Uh, for CSV files, there's really not much to say other than this plugin works very nicely. By the way, I have about 20 other plugins related to syntax highlighting for all the different languages and tools I use on a regular basis. That's one of the reasons why I really like Vim. It lets me use the same tool for everything. Multi-snips and Vim snippets really help with providing shortcuts for inserting code. 
Most editors have some type of snippet support and these work really nicely in Vim. As for this other plugin, it tells Vim to automatically pop up its code complete window while you type. I'm not sure if you've ever used something like Sublime Text in the past, but it's very similar to that where you can just start typing and anything that's in any one of your open buffers will just come up in that autocomplete window. The cool thing about this is none of these plugins require running a language server, uh, if you happen to know what that is. Uh, this is more for like a lightweight approach to get useful, but not hyper intelligent autocomplete that's context aware. Moving on, this one lets you zoom in and out of splits in Vim, just like you can do with Tmux. This comes in very handy if you're someone who likes to open a bunch of splits. Now, all of these plugins work together to serve the end goal of making it easier for you to find, search, and replace text. I use these all the time, especially the Visual Star and Vim uh, Grepper plugins. Uh, there's a 30 minute video linked in the references that goes over how to do various find and replace workflows in Vim. It ranges from searching for a character in a line to doing a regular expression based find and replace across multiple files. Lastly, there's two themes that I really enjoy using. Both of them have really good syntax highlighting for many popular languages, including R. Now, I used OneDark for all the screenshots in this talk, and I typically use it when recording videos, and then I switch over to OneLight for personal use. Prior to that, I used Groovebox for about two years. I still really like Groovebox, but like most developers, we get bored of themes over time, so I like to mix it up. But I could see myself switching back to it in the future. Besides Tmux, or besides plugins related to syntax highlighting, there's still about 10 or 15 plugins that I didn't mention, which are still worth using for specific things. Now, I don't quite have 200 plugins, but I would say I have about 45 or 50, but I do use them on a regular basis. I'm very protective of which plugins I add, and I also focus on keeping things as efficient as possible. You know, that means not using plugins that introduce typing delays or other hitches. With that said, all the plugins I use are listed in my VimRC file in my dot files, which are, also have one line commenting explaining what each one does. And that's gonna wrap things up for Vim. Now let's talk a little bit about dot files. We've already seen a couple of them, such as the profile, bash RC, and tmux config files. When it comes to configuring user settings for command line tools, it's very common to put them into various dot files. It's not a guaranteed rule, but most command line tools will use files that begin with a dot for its configuration. And there's three main places where they might exist. Some tools will write their config files into your user's home directory, which is what we saw before with the bash RC file, tmux config, and a couple others. It's also quite popular for tools to create a dot directory in your home directory named after that tool. For example, if we take a look here at my home directory, here's a couple of tools that do that. This usually happens when a tool has more than one config file, but not always. Sometimes a tool will place a bunch of files unrelated to its configuration, along with its configuration all in one spot. It's also pretty popular for tools to place their config files within their own directory within the .config directory inside of your home directory. That's a lot of directories. Uh, this is a newer standard based on something called the XDG based directory specification, which is linked in the reference notes if you wanna learn more about conventions or where certain files should live. Highly recommend checking that out. And uh, we can see that here. If I happen to write any scripts that need one or more config files, I always use the .config directory since it's a standard. So that's how configuration is mainly handled, but I sort of simplified where I store my individual dot files just to make the previous slides a bit easier to read. In reality, most of my dot files are sim linked to a separate directory that's contained within a Git repo. You can see that here with the arrow pointer, which is a sim link. Sim links are references to another file or directory. You can sort of think of them as shortcuts if you're coming from the Windows world. They're not specific to dot files, but they're often used together with dot files, so you can save your dot files in one centralized location and then symlink them to wherever they need to go in your home directory. And that leads us into one way of managing your dot files. I'm a fan of having a single directory somewhere on my system, such as this dot files repo in my GitHub folder, and then I can symlink the config files to where they need to go. This keeps things simple and it makes it easy to replicate my setup on another machine or share it with others. All you would have to do is clone down this repo, set up the sim links, and uh, you're off to the races. But sim links are not the only way to manage your dot files. There's dozens of tools focused on dot files management, but honestly, I never felt the need to go that far. A really popular one is called Yet Another Dot Files Manager, and I've dropped a link to it in the references. It's basically an abstraction on top of Git, and it comes with its own command line tool to manage your dot files. 
If you do find yourself gravitating towards wanting to use the .files manager, I would start with this one. I haven't used it personally, but I do know someone who was happily using it. That someone has been working on the command line for 15 plus years, and he looked at a lot of different tools, so I trust his recommendation. But that said, let's take a look at a few key parts of my .files repo on GitHub. In addition to the config files themselves, I included screenshots and documentation related to installing the tools I use on a few popular Linux distros and Mac OS. There's not really an unwritten rule to include installation instructions in your dot .files, but I decided to go the extra mile. I included them mainly because I have a few programming courses and I wanted a single place where I could point folks to in case they wanted to replicate or cherry pick a couple of things from my setup. For example, if you wanted to install Tmux, Vim, and a number of other tools, you could copy paste one of the package installation commands depending on what OS you're using. In this case, it's the Debian and Ubuntu installation instructions, but in the readme file, there's a copy pasteable command for brew in case you're using Mac OS. You can also choose to add or remove anything you see fit. For example, jq is a command line tool that lets you parse JSON. If you don't care about that, then you can just easily remove it. Then for installing the dot files themselves, it's a matter of cloning this repo and then setting up the sim links. You can choose to grab all of my configs or just the ones that you care about. For example, if you find yourself using Z shell instead of bash, you could just remove my bash RC file. Or if you're not using WSL, you can remove the last sim link there since that only applies to WSL. Also, if you want more control over your setup and you want a very personalized solution, uh, you can always skim through my individual configs and copy paste whatever you want directly into your config files. Beyond that, there's a bunch of commands like this where you can pick and choose to install whatever tools you want. There is quite a bit more than what's shown here, but all the rest are documented in the same way. And all of these commands are going to work on Linux and Mac OS since it's mainly running curl, git, and pip commands. Pip is Python's package manager, by the way. Then there's even reminders like this in the readme file too for installing plugins for Vim and Tmux. There's also this section here to help verify that everything is set up correctly. Lastly, it's worth mentioning that these dot files are going to evolve over time. In the references, I've linked to the exact commits for all the files we went over, but I do recommend checking out the master branch on your own, because if you're watching this talk in the future, chances are I've updated a number of things, which are probably improvements in some way or another. So that's the TLDR on dot files. If you Google around for dot files, or if you Google around for dot files GitHub, you'll find hundreds of other examples. I'm not really too sure how, how many of them will have uh, tons of documentation, but at least now you're familiar with the concept. And I think that's the main takeaway of this talk. You know, I tried my best to showcase and go over a bunch of tools, but ultimately it's up to you to apply as, as much or as little as you want in your daily workflow. Like anything, it takes time to build up muscle memory, especially for hitting hotkeys that might be foreign to you. I know it took me a really long time to get used to them and I still feel like I have a lot to learn. In other words, don't get discouraged if you struggle for a while, it gets better over time. And on that note, hopefully at the very least, I, a couple of unknown unknowns were discovered today. Usually when I watch a talk or read a book, I'm hoping to walk away with at least one nugget of information that I can apply back to my day to day. And that's all I have. Thanks a lot for having me. And if anyone is still awake and alive and we still have time, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. That was a whirlwind tour. I was yeah. sitting here thinking, okay, is he got, uh, I had a question. I'm like, oh, he answered that question. I had a question. He answered that question. And someone else sent me the similar message that they want and they had questions I'm like, oh, you answered it. So, right. That was really excellent. So let me pull up the few questions we have that may not still have been answered. Uh, to you, you went over so much stuff. Uh, sure. Someone mentioned, it wasn't so much a question, but a mentioning about when you're talking about manually setting colors in your PS1 about T-Put. Have you ever looked at using T-Put for setting colors? T-Put, not familiar. Is that the one where you can, it kind of just sets up like variables for you to reference like the color red instead of having to know to use like 32? I am not sure. Uh, hopefully someone in the chat, JKS, I think you're the one who asked it. So if you know, then uh, what Tipa does, let us know in the chat. Right. Why? Is he saying that he doesn't like all those escape codes? Come on. Yeah, no, those are fun to use. When I first started learning those, I'm like, uh, how am I supposed to get these right? Oh, I missed the care. I missed the bracket. I'm screwed. Right. Yeah. I did a lot of backing up when I tried using those the first time. Uh, you mentioned ASDF briefly. Could you just quickly uh, mention that, uh, go over that again? Yeah. So, well, I don't know who asked the question and like what programming languages that they use, but ASDF is kind of like a general purpose multi-tool that allows you to set up different versions of let's say Python or Node or Elixir or Ruby or any programming language. And you can kind of just like 
independently isolate all of your different versions. It's kind of like, I guess, using a virtual env in Python. It could be comparable to that, but it's more primarily used in uh, like the Node and Ruby and Elixir community. Honestly, I don't use it that much because I, I pretty much Dockerize all of my apps, but yeah, it's kind of useful for when I have to install Node. Can that work for any generic programming language or is it just for a certain subset? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, there's support for the tool internally. I, I don't know the exact list off the top of my head, but if you check their page out on GitHub, it has a full list of uh, all the languages supported. All right, cool. That could be, that's a whole big thing. You know, you have Conda and v, VN for Python. You have R and V for R, but R and V for R just handles the packages. It doesn't handle the versions. So that's actually the version of R itself. That's really nice to know. Yeah. Cool. Um, someone asking now, this might start a fight. Um, how practical is Emacs as the basis for the ecosystem you described? <laughs> honestly it's it's really opinion i mean you can go if you want to use emacs it's like basically a different thought process in my opinion so going like the vim and tmux and like command line approach it's like you're just putting together all of these tiny tiny little laser focused tools but uh what is that joke around emacs being like it's a pretty decent editor but uh it's a really good os right it's like emacs becomes your world uh, which in a, you know, in a way is definitely advantage. Uh, there's some good stuff about that, right? Just being able to write one scripting language and do all of your stuff there, but it's just not for me, but uh, don't let me deter you there. As I say, for me, and I'm sure a lot of people here, our studio is their world. Like I can never leave our studio. Like I can do everything I ever need to do in our studio and never have to go anywhere else. In fact, it even has a Vim and Emacs mode, has both modes. Uh, someone is asking, let me, Put on my screen where I can see it better. Um, are you still working on a full stack course that you mentioned a year ago? <laughs> Man, <laughs> putting me on the spot on that one. Yeah, yeah, I am. But right. it's, uh, it's pretty involved. And uh, there was like over 190 video tutorials and I got all the way through that and I decided to like ax the whole project just because I felt like it got too boring in the middle and I just gutted it and basically I'm working on it now. Okay, so we expect to see that what, next week or something? Uh, yesterday, maybe. Sure. Yes, we'll promise it for yesterday. Yeah. Um, someone asked me about, have you, have they asked, well, they asked me to ask you if you've heard of nvim-r. nvim-r. I have not. Unfortunately, I have very limited experience with R in the sense that, like, I've never even uh, looked at the language at all. So let, no. me, let me just make sure that was the right thing they asked about. I think it's, it's, it's a, yeah, N, oh, it's nvim-r-tmux. It's an integrated working environment for R. I think it just sort of, I'm guessing it probably puts an R console into Vim so you can make a REPL out of it is my guess. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of plugins I didn't really talk about that are very specific to different programming languages. Like you can have automated tests where you can just like move your cursor into a specific test that you have and hit a hotkey and then it just runs that test. So yeah, there's all sorts of stuff like that. Um, have you put any, have you done any videos or put any work or have any thoughts about using VS Code as sort of a command station? Sort of, kind of, but I feel, and you do mean like using like Vim mode inside of, inside of VS Code? I said that, but like using uh, VS Code for its terminal and using that as your editor instead of Vim, whether you use the Vim bindings or not, uh, sort of making that your entry point into Linux as opposed to the terminal as your entry point. Yeah, that's definitely not a bad idea. The reason I don't use that, I guess, is because like I really am juggling a lot of different projects. Like we're talking like, you know, eight to like 10 different projects all the time. And uh, I mean, I guess opening like 10 copies of VS Code, if I had like one instance for each of them on like, you know, a virtual desktop or something and I switched to that, that could work, but I'd also need like half a terabyte of RAM to uh, run that many concurrent copies of VS Code. Mm -hmm. Whereas Vim, even with those 50 plugins, it's like eight megs of RAM for, uh, for each copy. Uh, pretty good. Um, and it, VS Code, um, I've been using a lot lately because it, has the language server and the SSH compatible, like SSH into my server and it feels local, which I guess for you, you've got your Vim set up to feel local. Yeah, so the, the, like the one thing I really miss from VS Code, like I, I work with a lot of containerized applications, like their remote containers feature is awesome. And as far as I know, there's nothing like that in Vim. So, you know, there, it still does call to me once in a while. Yeah. I don't use it, but it's there in like the back of my head. All right, very cool. Um, there's a an, question just came in. When you're at, and I'm doing these sort of out of order the way they came in, just those things pop yeah. to me. Uh, when you're at the shell and you find a file to open, how do you open it in Vim without clobbering your shell window that you're active in? How do I open it in Vim without clobbering the shell? So do you mean like, let's see, I have, uh, I do have a terminal ready here. I wasn't lying about being ready for the, the live demos there. 
But do you mean like if I wanted to open up this directory here in Vim, like how do I make this not clobber this current window? So I would just open up another TMX window like this and I would just jump to the, to the other windows that I want to jump to. So I wouldn't worry about like not clobbering it. I would just open a new uh, window. Did I answer your question, Anthony? Um, they just, he opens a new window in TMUX. And technically you can also do something like, uh, what is it, like control Z or something to send it to the background and then you can use uh, uh, foreground to run, to get back to it. That also works. But I mean, at that point, I feel like it's just easier to open a TMUX window. Okay. I guess, so yeah, same thing asked to follow up, like, so you would clobber it, but uh, in a new window instead of the other one. So I guess yeah. there's, is there a way to make it, mo like modal is totally the wrong word. You know, if you open a program in Windows, it could be like a, min like a smaller program in front of the program behind it. Can you do something like that? Uh, maybe. It's not something I don't, I don't have any experience with. I haven't set anything like that. I feel like that would be probably something with your operating system, like maybe like layering a different terminal on top of your existing terminal, something like that. I don't know. Then speaking of multiple terminals, I know you can open up multiple terminals in Windows, I'm sure other operating systems, and even the Windows terminal has multiple tabs. How do you feel about the, using those tabs? Um, and even terminals has now, uh, Windows terminal has built in splitting. So where does yeah. that fit in with Tmux and everything? Eh, very, very rarely would I use those features because like if I just want to split that, I just do it with Tmux and there you go. But you know, jumping over here, I am using Windows Terminal here. So like I can just open up a new tab there. You know, it's a little small because uh, the font size, but you know, I will use this feature of the tabs like once in a blue moon, but honestly, just usually, you know, the same exact thing could be uh, done with a TMUX window. Like I, I feel like the windows here are basically tabs, but they're not. And I guess for someone, because a lot of people come in as new, if they want to use, let's say they have one terminal tab, but they want to split the panes. Like how do they, can you marry both TMUX and the Windows terminals planes, pane splitting or you have to sort of devote yourself one to the other? Uh, you can probably combine them both. But at that point I would ask myself like, why do you need to combine them both? Like I would pick one or the other. Okay, that's fair. Um, here's one, in your, when you're doing your TMUX, TMUX config, you had set, you had set W, you had set dash G. Uh, what were the differences between those? Uh, let me see if I can open that up, tmux.conf. So there is a whole bunch of different ones. Yeah, I know, I know what he means, like set GA and like set option and set W, like what the heck is all that? Yep. Uh, good question. I think these are like compatibility things. Don't quote me on that one. I hate to give bad information over a talk, but I mean, it's a lot of just like Googling for how do I like raise the history limit in tmux, finding a stack overflow answer with like a million upvotes and, and not too many people saying it's it's garbage and then I just use it and it works. So I keep it. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely like renumber windows it's set option and base index is set that like, you'd have to search yeah. by which it would be nice if there's a logical reason, which I'm sure there is somewhere in the back of some, you know, Linux devs mind from 30 years ago. Right. Like this is a great example, like this base index, like why do I have to set it twice? Like maybe in theory with this one, one of these will work but it's one of those things where like my config is still valid and Tmux is not yelling at me. So I haven't really gotten rid of it. And especially since the second one is set W. So it's even, it's not just setting it twice. The second one is set W. Yeah. And it's a totally different variable name too. Base index versus pain base index. Well, maybe these are separate to be honest. I'm not hundred percent, but they're both set here for a reason. So I'm hoping that uh, it was valid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's working, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, here's another one. How do you integrate this one running a script, like an R script or a Python script or insert generic script there? And you did, as soon as they answered that question, they asked that question, you did answer it in your talk, but I just want to throw it in there. Right. Uh, that's when you're talking about the shebangs. So how do, you, how do you integrate scripts into your workflow? Do you mean like developing them? Like if I were to be developing a script, usually, like my font size is so blown out here, but typically I'd have, uh, you know, like the script here in Vim, like I'm hacking away on the script on the left. And then I'm just like, running it on the right, like up arrow, enter, up arrow, enter. So it's like I have a side-by-side -side view of being able to develop the script and then run it at will. Okay. Let's assume that's what they're asking, so I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Um, I do that all the time, like if I'm developing any type of script. Okay. Um, how do you keep... So how do you keep so many, this is where I'm missing, but how do you keep key mapping straight? I guess how do you keep so many key mapping straight between auto hockey, Vim, Tmux, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> yeah. It's so many that it's insane, but honestly, uh, sticky notes goes a really long way. So like when I was learning these hotkeys, which I still fumble from time to time, just sticking like eight different sticky notes on my monitor just helped me just fuse them into my brain. And eventually it just becomes muscle memory and uh, 
you just, yeah, just get to it. Now, as for not clabbering the different keys, like, you know, stepping on each other's toes, then that's where the things like the prefix key and leaders key comes into place with tmux and vim. So if I'm running like a, a tmux command here, like if I do leader b to, to split this there, it's not really competing with anything else in my system because nothing else really has that bind where I'm doing the back tick and then, you know, something else. Mm. And for auto hockey, uh, we didn't go over that. That's not really command line focused, I guess, but usually I just bind those to like windows keys, like, you know, windows E or something like that. Windows E is taken though. That's the Explorer, but <laughs> yeah, bad example, but yeah, mm. that, I had to call it. windows W will open up uh, a web browser for me, which I don't oh. want to do now, but yeah, I have a couple of those set up. Um, this question, I, th I think I know where you're going to go. How do you get the Unix commands on Windows? So that, I mean, there's multiple ways, but the way I prefer to do it is the Windows subsystem for Linux. And uh, that is what we're looking at here. Like I'm actually running, uh, let me just maybe kill these out here just so we can see it a little bit better. I am running Ubuntu 20.04 here. So this is just WSL2. So this is something that Microsoft released and uh, you can basically just run it. Like I am running Windows here. You can't see my full screen, but there is like a Windows 10 taskbar below here. And yeah, it just runs like it's a tool you can install. It's actually, if you go to my dot files repo, there's a link there that goes over how I have my entire Windows development environment set up. It's like a 30 minute video. So I'm actually going to ask a follow up on that one. Um, where does Git bash now fall into play now that WSL2 has become mature or WSL in general has become mature? Do you still have to have Git bash to get Git on the Windows side or do you, do you, would you use Git from WSL on your Windows files? Yeah, so I don't use Git bash at all. Like everything right now is developed primarily inside of WSL2. So I have Git installed here. Okay, now, and, and I do know that the Git installed here works on Windows files. And I understand between WSL1 and WSL2, there is a speed difference in accessing files on the other file system. So would WSL, using Git on WSL2 uh, be fast enough to, to use Git on Windows files, if that made sense? Probably, like if you have your drive mounted to where you have Windows files, then it's probably not gonna be fast enough because I found that you're right, like that mount speed is just horrendously slow. I mean, I would imagine in future releases, it's, it's gonna get better. But in this case, like in my home directory source here, all of my uh, source code is living inside of WSL2, so it is lightning fast. So you can do that. And you can still access these files from Windows as well. So if you wanna open them up in you know, our studio or whatever, you can still do that. That's going to be my next question. If all of your code files lives in WSL and you just answered that. Yeah. Also, if you use VS code, then it has really good support for WSL as well. Okay. Um, this is not a question, but a comment. Um, definitely have to watch this a few more times to get everything. Yeah. And this takes me back to the days when the command line is how we did everything. Yeah. I guess there's some uh, nostalgia factor for someone who might be using the terminal for a long time and maybe just took a break and did whatever. This reminds me back when I used DOS back in the day and like that guy's is much better than DOS, but I couldn't remember anything. And nowadays, oh yeah, I'm back at the command line right where I was, I don't know how many years ago. Right. Um, I'll give a last chance to see if there's any other questions. We went through a lot of them. I'm sure Nick is exhausted. Yeah, I almost <laughs> passed out at like the 38 minute mark. <laughs> Glad you're still with us. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hot here in Long Island and I, I can't put my AC on because it's just too loud for the mic. Oh, that's awful. Yep. Uh, then one question that was then, so well, since you're going to start sweating bullets, um, your favorite backup tool? Favorite backup tool. Good question. Uh, that I actually wrote a shell script called backup, and it just uses rsync, and then uh, it just copies certain directories that I've whitelisted over to an external drive that's like an external USB drive. So, yeah, it kind of sort of don't want to show that one on video because there's certain directories in there that um, I don't know off the top of my head if I want to show them. Fair, fair. But it, yeah. your tool is available somewhere they can find it? Yeah. So if you go to, if you just Google for like Nick Genetakis rsync backup, you'll find a blog post with the whole entire script and an explanation of all of it. Great. All right. So I think that was a lot of questions. We had everything answered. Just let me just give a quick scroll to make sure I didn't miss anything. I feel like looking back and replaying the talk in my head, I think I may have misspoke a little bit about ASDF. Like it wouldn't replace virtual end with Python, but it could replace installing a specific version of Python, but you'd still want to use a VM inside of that. 
Got it. Because the VM is because the VM does a lot more than just the one version of the, the yeah. language. Okay. It's sort of embarrassing because like I've been working with Docker for so long. Like every time I Docker write, like if I'm developing a Flask app or a Python app, it's just like, I'm just using Docker. Very rarely do I use ASDF. Fair. Yeah. Docker's become such a uh, a thing now. I know it's big in the R community for uh, doing uh, reproducible research. Um, yeah. And so actually, that's, let me ask you one more question. You just triggered one in my mind. So many. So I know. I think traditional devs use Docker as they build on their computer, then they use Docker to capture the state of their computer. Or I think a lot of data scientists will want to develop inside the Docker containers. They want to get the environment set up first just that way, then develop in it. Uh, what pattern do you typically follow? Uh, I usually go for the pattern of just running one process inside of each container. So for example, uh, in this Flask example here, I mean, I, it, you know, there's no harm in, in showing this here. So if I open up like my, my Docker Compose file here, I am running Postgres and Redis and uh, the Flask like Unicorn web server itself, as well as Celery, like a background worker. But these are all running in individual Docker uh, just containers. So like Postgres is its own image. Redis, you know, these are the, the official ones. But yeah, even like the Unicorn web server and Celery, this works off the same code base, but I do have them running in separate containers. And so you do Docker Compose up and then do your coding in one of these containers or is your coding done in your machine? Yes, no, I'm, I'm coding it on my machine and then they're, uh, they're volume mounted in. So, I mean, it's a little bit cryptic to read with these environment variables, but yeah, it's just a volume mount. So these are just sitting on my local box. Uh, if I have cool. one of these windows open, yeah. Very cool. All right, um, all right, sorry, one more question. Someone snuck this in. Um, sure. Don't you worry about one of your 50 VIN plugins having a security vulnerability and and stealing your SSH keys, et cetera, or something like that? Uh, that's actually a, a really good question because like for a lot of things, especially if you're working with, um, you know, Python or Node or something like that, a package could be open source, but the code that you see on GitHub technically isn't the code that is running on your machine because the code that's running on your, on your machine is whatever they decided to publish to, uh, you know, PyPy or, you know, NPM or whatever. Uh, but for Vim, uh, the way plug works, the plugin manager, it's just get cloning stuff on your drive. So if I go to, I think it's in my Vim directory, in my home directory, I think under plugged, like there's just a million plugins in here. Some of them have uh, weird file permissions from WSL1. So ignore like the hard to read ones, but uh, all of these are just on GitHub somewhere. So you are free to check out all the code that you want, whether or not you want to go in there and look at like 800,000 lines of Vim script, that's up to you. But uh, <laughs> I kind of just trust the system sort of, just like if you're installing any dependencies, like, heck, I'm running Windows here, so yeah. So you're trusting the community to have seen the code and someone has calling BS that there's something bad. Yeah, I, I mean, there's not really that much else you can do other than you personally auditing like every single line of code. We're not all Richard Stallman. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and since you showed us your LS there, what does the dark green background mean? Because I think, you know, a lot of us get that with different colored backgrounds in our LS listings and sometimes wonder what it means. At least I do. Oh, let me go back to that one. Yeah. yeah so right now the file permission of like the ones that are almost impossible to read, I, I'm guessing they're just set to like 777. So like they're executable. And the problem with uh, WSL1, because I migrated from WSL1 to 2 is it just didn't support Linux file permissions at all. So it just made everything 777. So now I have all these directories and files on my system that are messed up like this, but I could change these to be what they should be. Mm. So like if I just do, I don't know, like a chmod uh, 0775 on like the Vim zoom one, like notice here on the bottom, Vim zoom is the green color. But now if I do this, uh, it should be back to normal. So yeah. I should go back in here and do this to all of them, but whatever, like it's not that big of a deal in yeah. this case. So, but I guess the answer then is like, typically the green background means that it's 777 permissions. Yeah, so if you look here on the left-hand side, I, maybe you can't read the text or whatever, but you can see the, the permissions are different than yep. the other ones. Awesome. All right, cool. All right, so thank you so much. Thank you, Anthony, for the moderator uh, comment. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, for, doing, for uh, speaking. Everyone, the video will be up in, a few a day or two, depending on Monica edit it, the slides you made available. If you have any slideshow, you can send that to us. We'll put it up on the NY Hack R site. Um, remember, you can get in touch with Nick. There you go, a bunch of different ways to get in touch with him directly. Um, follow him on Twitter. I know that's a comment that this community loves Twitter. Uh, next three months, we have Kat, uh, Katarina, we have Henrik, we have 
will. We have the DC conference coming up in December. The information is coming out. The videos from the R conference coming out. Uh, that'll be happening soon. And yeah, everyone check out NY Hack R for more stuff. And I look forward to seeing you next month and the ensuing month. So thank you everyone for coming. You know, I had a great time. I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did too. Uh, thank you, Nick. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Cool. And I'll just uh, sit here while we let people uh, drift away and see if there's any last stragglers. Right. Uh, maybe one day we could figure out about how to open this up so people could hang out like we did last week. So last week we had a hangout. People just got together and hung out, ate pizza, drank beer, drank soda, whatever they drink, or food that isn't pizza. I don't know why anyone would eat anything that's not pizza. But they were, and we just hung out. It's sort of nice because after these meetups, we usually go out afterwards to the local bar and hang out. We can't do that anymore, unfortunately. So maybe next time we'll find a way to convert this into a hangout session after the meetup. That's more for Amada than you, Nick. Sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay. At this no, point, I think... Everyone's sort of leaving now, but oh, it's still 23. I don't know how to switch it over, so I don't even want to guess because I don't know what I'm doing. So here's a real question while people trickle away. How do you drink on Zoom without looking like an idiot? Oh, it's hard. It is hard. Yeah. So you, so I teach um, like I teach three hour classes for Columbia every Monday, right? So it's three hours now on in, on Zoom in a row, like straight from like two to five. I got myself like a big adult sippy cup, like a big cup this big with a big thick straw. And I just sit there like a child drinking out of the sippy cup. Uh, cause I, I can't find anything better. And I can, right now my sippy cup's being clean. So I have a glass, which is dangerous. Yeah. It's brutal. It's like they ruined that guy's career. Oh no, it was Rubio. Like it sort of hurt his career a little bit when he had to reach for the cup and drink while on camera. Um, of course he had to reach for it like three feet out of his way. It was kind of silly. I don't have a good answer for you. It's hard. Yeah. I feel bad because I hit my mic once. I don't know at what point, but it was months. You know, and at least I didn't notice. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, someone's saying, oh, that's very nice. Nick, yeah. you didn't look stupid, actually. It was a total non-issue. Thanks. <laughs> uh, JKS is asking for the link to the GitHub repo for the dot files, which I assume is up on your GitHub somewhere. Yeah, it's like somewhere. So it's funny because of the way I'm showing my screen in Zoom right now, I can't even see my URL bar. So I don't even know where I am in the slide deck, but... It is live. Yeah, here we go. Perfect. So this is live right now. You can go check it out. Here you go. Uh, GitHub.com slash NickJJ slash NYHackR dash CLI dash dev dash ENV. Yeah. Cool. Oh, yes. That's in the uh, Slack. Oh, and, we also have uh, Slack, everybody. And I'll repost it here. Yeah. In a couple of days, too, when you upload that video, then I'll update uh, the link there, too, in the readme file to, to link to that video. Great. We have a collection of videos going back. I think our videos go back about six or seven years, and we have slideshows going back 11 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is a, there's a lot of resources in this community. So yeah. how bad did I butcher that guy's name, by the way, the one who gave that command line talk? Jeroen Janssens. So hard to pronounce. It is. I practiced I it too, like 10 times before the talk. I, I've, no, I've known him for maybe eight, 10 years. And it took me a few years until even to his face, I could get his name right. Um, as, a, I'm, I'm a, as an American doesn't speak any other languages, Dutch is, it was, I just had to get used to it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. He gave a, um, a really good talk. He wrote a whole book about data science on the command line. I think he's working on the second edition right now. Um, it, was a, it was a really popular talk. It was really good. Yeah. People yearn for the command line. All right. So with that, I think everyone's sort of, most people trickled away. There's a few people lingering watching us talk. So I'll just say, uh, have a good night, everyone. Enjoy the debate if you're watching that tonight. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next month for Katarina and ensuing months. And just feel free to reach out on Slack, on Twitter, any way you want to be in touch. Always welcome to say hi. That's the answer for me, at least. And I assume Nick loves being contacted too. Yeah, sure. Everyone here is very friendly. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And I'll see you soon. I'll kill the meeting. Bye. Thank you, thank Nick. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Mm -hmm.